Good morning and welcome to the ongoing series of Central Region Science Sharing webinars. Uh, today, uh, Mark Chenard uh, will be presenting on determining precipitation type from maximum temperature in the lower atmosphere. Uh, he's also worked with uh, Phil Schumacher and Heather Reeves uh, on this uh, research. So, uh, Mark, uh, take it away. All right, thanks. So I'm Mark. Now I work at the at WPC in College Park, but this is research that I did when I was in Sioux Falls with Phil um, and Heather. Um, not not necessarily really related to anything we do currently here at WPC. More more on a WFO uh, level. All right. So background. Uh, well, as we all know, precipitation type forecasting is difficult, and the impact can be. Uh, can be pretty different. You know, if you get an inch of QPF, if that's all snow or if it's mixed with sleet or freezing rain, uh, depending on how much of each you get, the impact can be vastly different. I mean, it's probably going to be high impact either way, but they are going to be different. Uh, so it is important to, to try to accurately forecast which will be the predominant type. Um, and, of course, QPF is a, is a big issue, but another one is um, what, what will be the type that is predominant. Uh, the current methods generally result in low skill scores, especially between sleet and freezing rain. They do a pretty good job of differentiating between snow and rain, um, but when, it be, when you get towards that mixed precip, whether it's sleet or freezing rain, um, you start to get a lot lower skill. Um, and that, that's with the precipitation type algorithms and a lot of other methods um, that are out there. So that does uh, bring up the question about the need maybe for probabilistic precipitation types. Um, if, if the current way we do things maybe isn't good enough to reliably say which one is going to happen, maybe um, may, is that a disservice to some of our users? users? Maybe we should be um, giving probabilities, you know, which one, maybe you could say which one's more likely, but at least have, you know, show that there is the chance of, of multiple types and just, you know, uh, which one is more probable, but the other one's still going to at least have probably a small chance in a lot of, a lot of cases. Um, so the, the, the goal of this project was to get a large data set of, um, of cases that, so that we could produce probabilities of different precipitation types based on, um, at least for now, we were just looking at the max temperature a lot. So the whole top-down method, just in a very simplified way, you know, you need to have ice in the clouds, so it needs to be cold enough um, so that we at least get ice formation. And you look at you know the warm layer aloft, or how much melting do we get, and then do we get refreezing um, below that warm layer? So as I mentioned, this talk is mainly going to focus or completely focuses on the the warm layer aloft contribution. That's not to say that the surface-based cold layer doesn't have an impact when it's averaged over all the cases. Uh, Reeves and, and Heather's and, and her paper found that the differences weren't significant. That's not to say that on individual cases that's the case, because I'm sure there are there are cases where you're going to get refreezing um, in the cold layer. But in general, the, the warm layer aloft seems to be the, the more um, determining factor for p-type in most cases um, at the surface. So what we did is we looked at 500 meters to 600 millibar layer um, and found the max temperature in that layer. Uh, of course, the depth is going to play a role as well, but for simple simplification, we just looked at the max temperature, which uh, past studies have shown there's a pretty strong correlation between the two, so we were um, okay with just with just going in that direction. Um, we used the data set from from uh, Reeves et al. Um, her paper, uh, which you know she had a good data set that had a lot of cases, and it so it definitely seemed like why reinvent everything. And she was uh, willing enough to to let us use that data and actually do a lot of the calculations um, for us from it. Um, so what it is is it takes the, uh, it was from 2002 to 2013, found all cases of winter weather that were within 35 kilometers of an upper air site. Um, we only included cases that had an elevated warm layer. So what that boiled down to was 422 freezing rain, 125 sleet, 34 snow. Um, so then what we ended up doing to try to get these probabilities is we bin that by every half a degree Celsius. Um, and then derive probabilities of snow, freezing rain, uh, and sleet for each bin. Uh, um, and then we also looked at the effects of uncertainty uh, due to model error. So we took the observed soundings and then perturbed them based on typical errors that were seen in uh, a mesoscale modeling system. I believe we used uh, typical errors from the, from the RAP. And then uh, we developed new probabilities from uh, taking into account 
what those normal errors are. So a couple of things before I get into it um, that could cause some issues with this. So it's not perfect. It's probably impossible to come up with perfect probabilities of this. So we're just trying to come up with something that is as reliable as we can get, at least as a first step. Because um, one of the issues is you have an unequal amount of sleet and freezing rain cases. So if you're trying to bin cases and uh, you have unequal amounts, that's maybe not the distribution that's actually seen in nature, then that could be a problem. For example, we had about three and a half, 3.4 times more freezing rain than sleet in our, in our data set. But one of the issues is that sleet is only going to be reported at sites that are augmented by a human, because otherwise it's just unknown precip, which, which wasn't included. And so you're going to have less sleet um, in the data set. And you know you, you do get less sleet. You are going to have, in general, I think, because it's more of a temperature range where, where freezing rain can occur than sleet. But it's probably not 3.4 times more. And that probably has something to do with the way the data collected, because some of the ASOS is can't report sleep. Um, so we, we tried a couple different methods of normalizing the data. One was we just assumed the one-to-one -one ratio, which is probably overdoing it. But we, we did that one where we just said we normalized sleep to freezing rain. And then we did a 1.7 to 1, where we said that freezing rain occurs 1.7 times more than um, sleep. And that's, it's sort of a subjective um, number there. We, there's a little bit of research out there, but it's pretty generic. Couldn't really find too much um, that that really went into how much common uh, freezing rain is over sleet. Um, so we, we went with that 1.7 to 1 as our second uh, normalization. Another issue could be that some of the freezing rain cases that we have in our data set could be because there isn't any ice in the cloud. Um, and it might have nothing to do with the warm layer. To try to get rid of those, we only um, kept freezing rain cases in which the temperature crossed the zero uh, sea isotherm twice. Um, so that would show that there at least was a warm layer. It's, it still didn't necessarily say that that was the deciding factor. Um, so future, future work um, still needs to try to go in there and do a better job of eliminating all the freezing rain cases that may not have ice to try to fine tune these probabilities. Because right now, we may have a little bit of a high bias in freezing rain at those cooler temperatures just, uh, just above freezing. Um, and then other issues are, you know, the weather balloon is going to drift uh, some. And we don't necessarily have a known launch time for all of these. And so not only is the ASOS within um, 35 miles, so there could be a little bit of, you know, could be a different precipitation type there than at the launch site. Plus, we had to estimate that you know most soundings, for example, the 12Z sounding was probably launched around 11Z. So, um, but there are going to be some minor errors that could come in just from that uncertainty. Uh, without really wasn't any way around around that. So, before I get into the probabilities, I just wanted to quickly show the just the uh, general distribution. So, these are just all the sleet cases on the left, um, and all the freezing rain. Um, on the right. So you can see pretty much below, um, uh, at least for sleep, most of them occurred below, say, 3.5 plus 3.5 C. Um, and most of the um, freezing rain occurred above plus 2. So there was, a, there was an overlap where there was a, a lot of both between plus 2 and plus 3.5. And, um, and then as you got, say, warmer than 3.5, um, you, didn't, you didn't have nearly as many, as many sleep. Um, and in the same way as you've got colder than um, plus 2, you didn't tend to have a whole lot of freezing rain in the individual distribution. Um, so then, you know, looking at the, the actual probabilities. So this is a not normalized one. So you can see here, like in the 0 to 0 0.5, uh, just as an example, you had out of all the cases, so we took all of the snow, all the sleet, all the freezing rain cases that had a max warm nose, uh, all right, let me, let me start over explaining this one. <laughs> we took all of the cases that had a warm nose between 0 and 0 0.5 and then um, bin them into uh, whether it's freezing rain, sleet, or snow. So in the, in the 0 to 0 0.5, 39% um, of those were snow, 46% were sleet, and 14% freezing rain. And you can see how that, that goes throughout. Now, in this case, you can see sleet only ever had a max. But for the reasons we mentioned earlier, 
probabilities are probably biased too low given the um, bias in the distribution set. So that's where the um, normalization came in. So the first way, again, was just a one-to-one -one normalization, which we, I think was probably overdoing it because I don't think sleet necessarily occurs as often as freezing rain. But you can see in this case, um, uh, it looks where you can see you got that cross right around two, two and a half, three, and then there's a wide range anywhere between say two and, and five where they're where they're pretty close um, sleep freezing rain probabilities. So the one that just from subjective experience and then from the little bit of research that's out there that seems like might be the best normalization is, is this one here, which you know is that um, 1.7 or if you go the other way around the P, uh, sleep normalized 0.6 to freezing rain. And you can see in this case, um, again, sleet only has its highest probability at, at 63% um, between uh, about 0 and, and plus 2. If we assume that the precipitation type becomes dominant at 60%, um, there's no type that's dominant between plus 0 0.5 and, and plus 3. So that's a pretty, pretty wide range uh, of temperatures there where we're neither uh, sleet, freezing rain, or snow are dominant, um, at least according uh, with the way that we bend them. Sleet uh, was the dominant p-type between uh, 0 and 0 and a half, with freezing rain generally become dominant greater than, than plus 3. Uh, so kind of, you know, a lot of what I think is currently out there that this agrees with. Uh, maybe the, the one thing that stood out here again was just how the sleet never really gets that high. Um, it seemed to always have some chance of, of, of freezing rain these lower temperatures. And then what we did is, as I mentioned earlier, we were going to perturb the, the data set. So we took each, each case and perturbed it a bunch of times based on errors that are commonly seen um, in, the, in the wrap. This is something from Heather Reed's paper. Uh, if any of you have read that, it was the same technique that she used in her paper to perturbed um, sound, the soundings. And so you end up getting more cases, so you get smoother curves when you do this. Um, otherwise, if I go back between the two, you can see really all it is, for the most part, is the smoothing. Um, so all the little up and down hills and valleys sort of get smoothed out as you get, as you get more cases. Again, uh, sleet in this case really only maximized at, at 54%, uh, right there between uh, about 0 and 1 C. Again, the freezing rain became dominant at uh, once you got above plus three, and stayed right around 30 percent for quite a while, all the way from plus three to the plus five and a half. Uh, again, there could be some of these sleep probabilities at these really warm temperatures could be because of a surface-based cold layer. So again, that again future work to try to eliminate um, uh, some of those. So really, I guess the only thing, again, as we perturb them, the difference is that, you know, actually the sleep probabilities decrease some, suggesting that I don't necessarily know what that suggests, uh, other than it, it could just be a smoothing of the curve. It's possible that you know, a lot of the time the model is missing a little bit of a warm layer, and so when you take into account that uncertainty, um, your, your, your sleep actually is a little bit lower because maybe the model was underdoing the amount of warm air in a narrow in a narrow layer. Um, so if we look at all cases, so pretty much what, what we were doing before, if I go back, was just the one that had a warm layer. Um, but we also did the same thing with all of the cases from her data set. And that's I, really what I wanted to show here is uh, just point out even like the snow probability. So for example, and this would be uh, at zero hours again perturbed, that even at zero to zero and a half, the probability of no, it was only 53%. So only 53% of the cases we had that had a warm nose between 0 and 0 0.5 were snow, suggesting that it drops off pretty pretty quickly, as I think as, as would be expected um, in a way. But even as you're a little bit below 0, like half a degree to, to 0, 25% of them weren't snow. Again, suggesting that whether it's one of the error, you know, it could be just an error in the the, where the ob was and where the balloon was launched, but it could also very well be the fact that we're again we're at a zero hour perturbed. So the once you take into account some uncertainty, um, you, it's very possible that you're not getting 
know, even if every model that you're looking at has a has the whole sounding below zero, it this would show that there's still a chance that that it's not going to be snow because the model could be wrong even at even at hour zero. As we go to hour twelve, so this would be the um, normal errors uh, perturb perturbing with the normal errors seen at hour twelve. If we go back between the two, you can see one thing that that stands out is the sleep probability again actually goes down and. I think that would make sense. It's actually never even higher than freezing rain at any time. And I, I think what could be going on there is that as you go, fleet has a narrow range, a much narrower range of possible, uh, temperature needs to be in a much narrower range than for freezing rain. And so as you go out in the forecast, given the increasing model uncertainty, your, your probability of fleet going down. Because even if, even if the, the forecast had, say, a plus two um, warm nodes, which would normally have a higher probability of sleep, because of model errors going one way or the other, the sleep probability actually decreases, and then on some of the other probabilities increase, um, because there's a much, much wider range of temperatures you could get snow, anything below zero, or, or freezing rain, um, anything warmer. And so uh, summarizing some of the stuff that we showed here, some of the, the main points again were that it seemed like it should be rare to forecast only sleep. Um, most of the normalization stuff we were looking at there with these bin probabilities showed that those probably only maximized between about 54 and 63 percent. And those are at temperatures just above uh, zero. So instead, maybe maybe using a mix of sleet and freezing rain should be considered in, in most cases. I think that's what a lot of this showed is that there's a wide range of temperatures above zero that um, where the probabilities of sleet and freezing rain are close enough that it, it'd be hard to really say you're going to get one and not the other, or, um, or vice versa. And so it, it kind of showed that even, even with freezing rain, um, until you got about the plus five or plus six, it really, it really didn't become dominant in tool those temperatures. So anything with the warm nose below that, there was a, um, a non-zero uh, reasonable chance that you were going to get sleet at least mixing in and at least being one of the one of the p-types. Um, and then when when you start increasing the account for model errors, um, start to broaden distributions as I mentioned earlier. So I'm not going to go read some of these last bullet points because a lot of these is what um, I had just mentioned um, when we were actually looking at the, the graph. Uh, if there's anything here Really. All right. So the application um, of this, and really the reason why we did the research, is because we were using the probability of weather type tool, which is developed um, WFO and lacrosse. And it was a good, we really liked the tool because that's it, exactly what it did was generate probabilities of um, at least for winter weather. It did snow, sleet, freezing rain, and it, it not only included the warm nodes, it also includes the, the cold layer below and an ice in the cloud. So it's a full um, top-down technique that develops probabilities of, of the different precipitation types. But, you know, we were looking at it and there really wasn't a lot out there deciding what, how to derive the probabilities. The, the ones in the initial set seemed good, it seemed like a good first guess, but we were just curious if we could improve it or, or maybe get some facts as to why we could trend some of the probabilities that were initially in the tool um, using, uh, using actual data. So that's why we actually went through and, and did this. So uh, just, uh, I guess for those out there that aren't from, as familiar with the, um, with the tool, just a quick uh, example that it actually is more complicated than this. But if you had like an inch of QPF in a six hour period and your probabilities were say 25% chance no, 50 sleet, 25 freezing rain, um, assuming those ratios that you see there uh, your totals would come out to be about two and a half inches of snow, an inch of sleet, and a quarter inch of freezing rain. Now it does it hourly, so your your probabilities can change by the hour. So this is a simplified version, but generally gets uh, what the tool does across. So if we could again improve these these probabilities, then this tool could give a scientifically um, sound forecast that that would give you, based on at least the best that we know, the most likely amounts of whether it be snow, sleet, and, and freezing rain. And if, if everyone was using it, it would be more consistent from WFO to WFO. 
if we go from look at this next slide because I think there's a lot of you know consistency is a big topic and I think everything it's gotten better now with um, the way stuff's being done and now you have the new uh, super blend with QPF in central region but it doesn't necessarily mean that the snowfall is going to be collaborated because it, that comes down to precipitation type. Um, and so like, now I'm at WPC, and um, so we do do snow, but at, the way it's done here is it's actually a 24-hour snow ice totals that are then disaggregated in the six-hour grids for use at the local office. Now if, let's say, an office wanted to use the snow here, let's say they were collaborated and we all agreed, and we produced the snowfall forecast and send it out, it's going to be hard to use that in a mixed precipitation case you need to make sure your grid, your weather type, match your snow and ice. You can't have eight inches of snow and then you run this tool and it comes up with um, all sleet and freezing rain. That's not going to work. Um, so you somehow, if you if you wanted to use what's produced here exactly, you have, you have to go backwards, uh, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but you'd have to put in the snow and then figure out how to get the weather consistent. So it seems to make more sense the way that it's usually done is, you know, using the QPF and then derive, derive the snow. Um, and so to maybe help, I guess one of the questions I just throw up there, and uh, I don't really have answers, but it is whether it'd be useful to have some sort of like model probabilities of weather type. Uh, one of the negatives I guess I could see with this is it would be using the model surface temperatures, um, but maybe in the, then in a way they could be modified by what whatever's put in GFE for the for the surface temperatures. But then I think it would give some, some sort of starting point instead of necessarily even having to go through and do a bunch of different tools or whatever. If you, if you could get, um, if each model came with probabilities of snow, sleet, freezing rain, then you could blend them however you wanted, agree to that blend with everyone, and everything would be good, and you had the same QPF, you'd have the same snow. Um, it would be a much simpler, simpler process. Now, I don't know what the method to necessarily do that is. Again, this was really, this talk just to, to get some ideas out there on the, what the different probabilities are as you look through the warm nose. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Um, when I gave this, this talk, it was given at Chicago at the uh, WAF conference, and the talk after was actually Heather Reeves has a talk on, she gave a talk on microphysical, um, a microphysical technique that could be run on any model um, that would, and she was able to, again, by using the it would really just produce a deterministic snow, sleet, freezing rain. But then by using her per perturbation technique, she was able to derive probabilities from every model at any timestamp. Um, so whether it's something like that, I, I don't know. But um, so I, it's kind of not directly related to the, to the research that I presented above, but it kind of is, I guess, in, in trying to produce some sort of single forecast that blends in. But um, see. So that's really the meat of the, the talk. Um, but we, if, you, if there's any questions out there or anything, I'd be happy to, to answer. Yeah, hey, Mark. This is Dan Baumgarten Lacrosse. And uh, hey. thanks for presenting this day and doing the research. It's always fun to see um, new people delve into this area. When I, 15 years ago, when I started doing some of this work and, and looked at Bob Rauber's study, who gave me um, a great deal of his data, and and you you had cited that earlier in your talk. I went through and I looked at his sounding data, and 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 I'm not familiar with what Heather did um, on this work, but I, I went through those sounding data sets and and derived uh, or looked at the surface observations for up to three hours before and after those soundings. And his data sets were pretty dirty. You know, the, the, the data sets that said sleep usually had many different types within an hour, um, even more so when you look at three-hour windows. But making those, purifying those data sets is key to this kind of research. The other one, that, the, other, the other thought I had on this was, was that these scenarios where you can get a warm nose, but it's a surface-based 
liquid layer that has no ice in it, you almost have to go through sounding by sounding and make sure that you're sounding data to move that uh, situation because you can have a surface-based super cool layer where a loft it goes to plus one and then you can you can get freezing rain out of that scenario uh, and and when it's in your stats I guess my my biggest comment is is we should probably be careful on how we want to move forward without ensuring that the data set is is clean now I'm not saying your data set isn't purified but um, I don't know how Heather did it and um, it's just something that we need to make sure of before we draw conclusions and and change some operations on on how we're forecasting or change the, the probability of weather type so I, yeah. I don't have a specific question but I think I think it seems like there's a little bit more purification needed maybe you could maybe you could elaborate on that yeah, I can comment on it. And no, and I would agree. I, I wouldn't. I I don't think it's realistic at all to say that these probabilities are anywhere near um, perfect or anything. Because, uh, like you said, I did start looking through her data set. We pretty much for for this um, talk I gave. I forget when that conference even was, but a couple months ago. Um, and for a time thing at that time, did not. I we pretty much took her data set that she used for her paper and sort of trusted that. <clears throat> You know, she had gone through and, and done some of it. From looking over it, I have gone through and started looking. You're right; it is it is dirty, though. You do have a lot of mixed cases within an hour of around the time of, of launch. Um, and I did start looking at all the at a lot of the freezing rain cases. And it'd be you'd be amazed. Well, since you've looked at it, I'm sure you're you're uh, familiar. But it's amazing how many of them are so close. Like you look at it, and it's like, wow, that is very borderline of whether there's ice in that. Um, cloud or not. So you're right, there's, it's definitely something that you'd have to go through and take some time, but that's why I just haven't been able to do it yet, because 400, pretty much have to go through all 400 freezing rain cases, um, and then eliminate the ones I think that are even questionable um, to try to, you know, fine tune and make sure that freezing rain at these um, colder temperatures. Because I feel like it's definitely going to be a little bit a little bit lower than what you see here. I think that this is biased a little bit too high on the freezing freezing rain at the colder temperatures. Um, I think that they it is there's still going to be some probability, and maybe it's just from the model uncertainty where it, where it comes in. But uh, I would definitely agree that while maybe this could be used to nudge some things in a direction, I don't think that any that necessarily significant changes just based on this until we can um, fine tune everything. Yeah, thanks for your work. And you know, like this slide here, you, we've got like freezing rain, the zero to one degree in those first two columns of 36 and 38 percent, and that that just screams to me that that's probably one of these cloud situations where we don't have a deep cloud situation going on that that's giving us those percentages, but. Anyway, thanks for presenting this. I appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, thanks.